froth of a, a certain plastic which lets the water in and doesn't let the plants up. So the seeds get um, smothered and uh, you, so we put the, 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 the plastic, the brick on top, and that's supposed to do away, consider for good, the weeds. Well, it, it worked perfectly for three years, and then eventually, uh, in my dismay, the bricks being nibbled away by frost in winter turned more or less into powder. And that powder is a wonderful setting for, for seedlings to start there. So uh, having removed the big plants, now we've got tiny ones. Nevertheless, the roots don't go through. So we remove them very easily with gentle rating. And, if, uh, and uh, eventually, I did change my mind after a lot of experience, and we spray them gently with, with gramoxone. It only kills. It acts like, like a frost or a fire, and uh, it, it doesn't remain. I mean, the whole thing disappears, and that is a very time-consuming uh, job done away with. I think I've been, uh, yes, you saw a photograph of fish. Uh, I think one should uh, talk about fish. Those moats were full of weeds. Uh, I don't mean weeds, weeds growing in the water. And uh, they were difficult and it looked messy. And, and uh, when there was a, a stormy weather, some kind of slime floated up. And, uh, and wouldn't go down again until it poured with rain and sank them again. So to do away with that, we put fish, carps, uh, where you have to feed them with wheat, and they uh, run around looking for wheat or in the mud, and by moving that mud permanently, all the, all the, all the little seedlings that would happen disappear or gobbled up. And as the water is very clear, it's crystal is very uh, 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 hard water, there's no silt, sinks to the bottom. So the water is crystal clear, and the carp keep it, although there's a mud when they do fight for a piece of bread or for uh, nibbling away, the whole thing settles down in five minutes and you've got very good, good water. And in another photograph, which we saw too fast and it wasn't very good anyhow, we use uh, uh, Asiatic fish called Amour Blanc, which come from outer Mongolia and who eat grass like cows do. So you've, if you, uh, you've got a complete covered up pond, you dump in a heavy weight of fish and you wait, and suddenly the, the grass is gone. Uh, as the cows eating in the front of the silage, they, they, uh, we had them there and the, and the front of the silage moved one yard a day. And at the end, there was nothing left. The fish stayed there, nothing to eat, and they don't die. I can't explain it, but there we are. <laughs> well, I thought, uh, I, I'm sorry I've been too long, uh, but I, I wanted to give you an idea of what has happened in Rouen and how we tried to resolve the, the, the labor problem and to make it more simple to, to keep. Uh, and we hope uh, that... Uh, what is on today will be able to carry on a certain amount of time uh, for, for, for our pleasure, uh, the pleasure of our children, and with the pleasure of people who are kind enough to come and visit us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I like the photos of the... This is the button. You just press forward here. That's well. the button. Are the photos on class three? Je là, je sais, je sais. Bon. Oui. No, this one on the right, isn't it? No, no. Which is the one?
I'm, I'm right in Ramonte. Well, after my husband's very professional and technical expose, I will just tell you my very small side of the story. Basically, there was not much we could really change at Courants. But we wanted to make the place more human, less imposing. There were quite a few little things we thought could be done. About 10 years ago, it was one of our wedding anniversaries, and my husband wanted to give me a nice present. So he said, what would you like? I said, I want a gardener. <laughs> no, it's, uh, no, it's true. <laughs> Till then, I had been working in the garden with very helped by very nice but totally ignorant farm hands my husband was telling you about who helped on the, the walls uh, and the farm, but they didn't know a thing about flowers or plants. They were very helpful, but it was a lot of work and I was getting less young. So he said, okay for gardener if you can find one. That's not so easy as I think you all know. Well, having had an English nanny for our children, I went to Smith's in Paris and bought a wonderful magazine called The Lady. <laughs> no, it's perfectly true. Believe it or not, in the first issue we found Tony. Well, Tony came from England. He was wonderful and he stayed with us for about four years. Bon. As far as gardens, Courance is really divided in three things. There's the Japanese garden, the surrounding of the chateau, and the kitchen garden. We started working on the so-called Japanese garden, taking away banal plants and putting in more interesting ones, building a small wall, enclosing lots of new precious little shrubs, cutting down or trimming all that had got quite out of proportion. We put in masses of spring bulbs and created a new rockery. Voilà. The next area, and maybe there's another one of the Japanese, we. Oui. You see, that is it, how it is today. And there's the church my husband was telling you about, you see, in the background. And lots of uh, the little trees, the maples, the Perosia Parsica, all that which were there and we thought had been lost during the war and the wilderness, popped up again, which was wonderful. You see, it was created by that English lady gardener, Miss Lloyd-Jones, with my husband's grandmother. It was really just a square pond and she had the idea of putting in a little island with bridges on it and she'd been to Japan and she brought back the first sort of, it was done in 1925 about the first Japanese maples and sort of rather rare things for the, that moment. And as I say, we were lucky enough not to lose them. Now this is the other second bit. The next area, as I said, there were three, the Japanese around the house, and the kitchen garden. The next area, which is this, is a sort of island on which the chateau is built. There are lots of sandstone balustrades all around, lots of them, very classical, very beautiful, but a bit pompous. So we dug holes about every five or six meters and uh, filled it with lots of creeping plants. Um, what can I tell you? Honeysuckle, uh, roses, Cernotus, Bignonia, Clematite, Hydrangea, Petiolaris, all the sort of rather maybe ordinary, but sort of took away the rigidity, rigidity of the thing. And of course, many, many roses, Kipsgate, um, New Dawn, Swanee, Mermaid, Aloha, Cecil Brunner, and lots of other ones to make it sort of smoother. That's always skip gate, I think. No, that is uh, New Dawn. You see, it softens the, 
the, the atmosphere. Against the house itself, to make it look less grand and more informal, we added a small border with simple plants, lavender, sedum, nepeta, shrasia, perotskia, cyanotis, brunera, nothing extraordinary and not too much color. There we are beginning. And the border was backed by something never done in France, is, I don't know how you say it, palissé in English. Pleached. It doesn't exist. We look in the dictionary, we'd never found it. Palisade, I mean, stuck against something. Palisade, Magnolia Grandiflora Triversis, Triviensis, which we clip with uh, clippers, and so it's flat, flat, flat. And it's very nice because it softens the architecture of the place. And in summer, it's lovely smells coming through all the windows and on the terrace. On the lower terrace, unfortunately, you can only see one on the right, and it isn't in bloom now. We've put uh, big pots with datura, brugmansias, and that also, in summer, smells wonderful, though it's supposed to be poison, as you know. As, as far as the kitchen garden, the old, in the olden days it was enormous, eight acres. My husband rented out five acres to a local nurseryman. We knocked down all the old-fashioned and mostly smashed up greenhouses. Now we have only one small greenhouse for the seedlings, the winter flowers for the house, paper, white, jasmine, and the hyacinths, etc. For the flowers, we go all we can for the house and for our flat in Paris. Nothing extraordinary, but all the sweet-smelling flowers possible, and the roses are a big success. As far as vegetables, the garden has been brought down to just a few things. Baby tomatoes, sweet corn on the cob, some raspberries, rhubarb, and of course, all the fins herb, parsley, tarragon, basilic, dill, etc. It's much easier and cheaper to buy things in the local market next door. <laughs> Although this is just the end, when after four years, Tony went back to England, a lot of work had been done. We were very sad, but also very lucky, as he provided us with an excellent, very artistic and very pretty lady gardener, Naomi. She had been his girlfriend, and she continued and improved what he had begun. We, with her, had a lovely time also. Alas, after three years, or four years, Naomi got married and left us to go home to England. I was desperate. I called everybody I knew who knew about gardens. I wrote many letters, but to no avail at all. One month before her departure, Naomi told me she knew of a young lady gardener with good references who would like to come and work at Courant. I was, as you can imagine, absolutely delighted, but a bit worried that she also would get homesick and want to go back to England. But no, she was French. That was already something, but where did she come from? Well, Ilona, she is called, she is 29 years old, and though this seems totally unbelievable, it is true, she's been living since always, and we did not know, in the village of Courant. <laughs> voilà, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you.
So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to have the opportunity to present you the Chateau and the Gardens of Villandry. Uh, please excuse my, my English, which is not uh, fluent, but uh, I will try to speak slowly in order to be understood. Uh, my name is uh, Henri Carvalho. Uh, I'm the owner with my sisters of Villandry. Uh, I live there all year round with my wife and children, uh, and I manage a place, uh, which is a work involving uh, three parts, the gardens, managing the gardens, the restoration of the chateau, we do quite uh, uh, a lot of restoration every year, and the touristic organization, because uh, it's the only way, of course, to, to make Villandry uh, live is to ha receive many visitors all year round. My presentation today will be split into two parts. First, uh, the history of Villandry, concentrating uh, mostly on the period of the creation of the gardens, which was achieved by my great-grandparents, uh, Joachim Carvalho, who was a Spaniard, and Anne Coleman, who was an American lady at the beginning of the 20th century. The second part will explain how a family nowadays takes care of such a place and find ways to maintain it and improve it every year. So let us start with uh, the history. Uh, Villandry is situated in the Loire Valley, about 250 kilometers south of, southwest of Paris, at the uh, uh, southwest of Paris. So at the beginning of the 16th century, during the, the Renaissance, the French kings used to live in the Loire Valley. So many important chateaux, we could quote Chambord or uh, Chenonceau, were built there at this time. And Villandry was, uh, was built uh, by Jean Le Breton, who was uh, a finance minister of Francis I. Um, he, he, he was also in charge of uh, the building of uh, Chambord for the king, but for, for himself he built Villandry between 1542 and 1546. So it, it's the last of the great Renaissance chateaux uh, of the Loire Valley. And the architecture of the, of the chateau is, is typical of the end of the Renaissance. So maybe I will put the first slide. What should I do? Ah, you have a, a general view here of the chateau and the gardens. Um, can I go to the next one myself or? or uh, I didn't. Forward, yes. Uh, so so uh, I was speaking about the architecture of the chateau, which is. Um, typical of the second part of the Renaissance, and the style is much simpler uh, than in the first part of the Renaissance, in, in the beginning of the 16th century. Uh, the Italian influence is not so important anymore, and there are no more reminders of the medieval architecture. So it is a purely French architecture that announced the future uh, Henry IV style in the 17th century. So at the beginning of the century, uh, in 1906, Villandry wa was bought by my great-grandparents, Joachim Carvalho and Anne Coleman. Um, Joachim was born in uh, Estramadura, in the southwest, southwest of Spain. He, he was coming from a very um, modest family of, the, uh, of Spain, you know, it's a very remote uh, Estramadura, it's a very, very remote place in Don Benito. And so it's quite an unusual story um, t for him to, to be able to, to create these gardens around Villandry. Uh, first, he, he was able to go to Madrid in order, as he was quite a good student, and so he was studying medicine in Madrid. And uh, his teacher sent him to, to Paris at the end of the 19th century. And he became a searcher. He was a main colleague, actually, of uh, Professor Richet, who had the, the Medicine Nobel Prize in 1914. 
And so there he, he met my great grandmother, uh, Anne Coleman, who was a young America, American student uh, who came to Paris because Par Paris was still quite uh, uh, an important place for uh, medicine at this time. Um, she, she was in Paris to study medicine. Uh, and that was quite unusual as well for uh, uh, a young American to be able to, uh, at the end of the, of the 19th century, to go to, to Europe to make some studies. Um, and uh, her family um, had made, was very wealthy. They, they were coming from Pennsylvania and they had uh, made a fortune in the steel industry in the 18th century. So the first coal man came from, uh, uh, from Scotland, then he went to Ireland, and then in, in, the, in, in America in uh, 1748. Um, and um, so they met in Paris, and, but the, the, it was quite difficult to, to, for them to get married because, uh, of course, the American family was not uh, so sure about this uh, youngest. Spanish man coming from a, a very poor family. And so the Professor Richet went to, to, to Philadelphia. He had to cross the Atlantic in order to persuade Anne's family to uh, authorize a mar marriage, which took place in, uh, in Lebanon, so in Pennsylvania, in uh, 1899. So that's both of them. So their first task when they arrived in Villandry, was to restore the chateau in its Renaissance state. Because, unfortunately, Villandry had been transformed uh, during the 18th and 19th century. And you see uh, this photograph, which, is, uh, which was taken before they started their works, so in, uh, maybe in 90, 1900. Uh, and you see, compared to the slides we saw before, that uh, the, the Renaissance architecture, which is quite simple, had been changed quite a lot in order to, to make a chateau, uh, a much more comfortable chateau. They, they had uh, created many windows, which is not uh, orthodox compared to the, to the 16th century architecture. And you should have, you see the dormer windows, you should have only one set of windows underneath, and not, and not so many as, as you can see here. Um, there had been a little pavilions created on the top of the tower as well, which was probably quite uh, comfortable and uh, which allowed to, to, to have nice dinners and nice views, but which were not uh, good for the architecture. So their first task was to to go back to the state of the 16th century uh, for the architecture. And this, this was quite quick, actually. They, they, it took one year, from uh, 1907 to 1908, uh, with the help of uh, 100 uh, workers. Um, and then, after so going back to the state that you can see today, uh, they decided that the gardens that were surrounded Villandry, uh, which was more a park, you, you can see a part of it, you know, with, with lawns, uh, big trees, and uh, which was more a, a romantic park that had been created in the 19th century, didn't fit with the architecture of the chateau. So they decided to create gardens which would be in harmony with the architecture of this chateau. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have any, any plans of Villandry. They didn't, uh, of the state of Villandry in the 16th century. Um, so what they had to do is, is uh, to study all the architectural book of, uh, of garden and uh, buildings of this uh, period, and they also uh, discovered the foundations of the walls that used to be in Villandry and which were creating gardens in terraces uh, that had been uh, removed because the, the 19th century garden were more like a, a, a one continuous slope. So they discovered these walls, telling them that they had been 
uh, in the past some uh, terraces, garden in terraces. And th there is also a letter from the Card Cardinal d'Aragon, uh, which came to Villandry in, in the 1540s, uh, and who wrote to the Pope that he had eaten uh, some salads in Villandry better than in Roma. So there was a, a quote about uh, kitchen garden. And um, I was speaking about um, different books of architecture. W one of the books in which they took their inspiration was uh, quite a famous book from Androuet du Cerceau, who, who is a famous archi French architect of, of the end of the 16th century, called uh, Les Plus Excellents Bâtiments de France, so the, the, the best uh, French uh, buildings, in which you have ma many uh, of his drawings. Uh, I, I have taken one in example, which represents the general organizations of the chateaus and the gardens surrounding them in the 16th century. And this is Bury, uh, which was the chateau of Florimond Roberté, uh, another mi minister of Francis I, which, which, does not, which does not exist anymore, but which is not far in the Loire Valley as well, not far from Blois. So most of the, the main chateaus of the Loire Valley were organized in this way. And you see uh, on the lowest part on, on, the, on your right here that you have a kitchen garden uh, made out of geometrical squares, uh, which is so on the lowest level. And it's very, very close to the chateau, so it has to be decorative as well. It's uh, functional and decorative. And it's so close to the chateau because um, new vegetables are coming at this time from Italy and America. And the owner of the chateau wants to see how they, these new vegetables will do uh, on the French soil. Uh, later on, uh, the potager will, of course, still exist in, in all the, the chateaus, but they will not be so close anymore to the chateau. They, they will keep their, func their functionalities, uh, their, uh, their function of being, uh, you know, of filling the chateau, but they will not be uh, decorative anymore. Um, that's the 16th century, and one century later, you will begin to have what we call the, the classical French gardens, uh, which are not closed like this. On, on the second level here, you can see uh, at the same level on the left here, the same level of the living room of the chateaus, you have the ornamental garden, which is uh, the outside living room, actually, of the chateau. Um, and you can notice that the farm cl uh, on the right of the chateau uh, is at the same level as the kitchen garden, and the, the ornamental garden is a bit higher at the same level as the chateau. So th they, they took the, their inspiration into this kind of, of drawing of Andrew du Cerceau, to create uh, the garden that, that we can see today in Villandry. Uh, and you, you can recognize so on the right, uh, on the lowest uh, part, the, the kitchen garden. And you can see it on the picture, but we also have the farm very close to it. it, it it's, uh, the principle is very similar to the one uh, you, you can see in Bury. And on the, the back of the chateau, you have the ornamental garden. Um, at the same, same level, uh, in, uh, with the same idea as the living home of the chateau. So, um, I explained the general ideas between, uh, be, behind these gardens. I will make now um, a short description of the three gardens that compose Villandry. And you see that there are three levels, so the kitchen garden, which I spoke first, the ornamental garden on the second level, and on the third level, you have a, a water garden. So we can begin with the, what we call the potager, so the vegetable gardens or, or the kitchen garden. And this kitchen garden in, in Villandry, um, so which is typical of the of the, the kitchen garden of the 16th century w was described uh, by Hugh, jo Hugh Johnson in the Journal of the Royal Horticultural Society as the most quintessentially French hectare on the earth's surface. So, so it's, um, 
It's a garden which is made of uh, nine geometrical squares. I will sh show you some details. Uh, and in each square, you have diff di different, different patterns. Uh, so th this, this kitchen garden that were uh, quite usual in the 16th century uh, is coming from, there, there are two influences uh, behind this garden. The first one is the medieval influence of the Middle Age because the monks in their abbeys used to, to grow vegetables and they used to, to, to plant them uh, in patterns, in geometrical patterns, and that's why you, you will see many crosses in the geometry of the kitchen garden in Villandry. Um, the, the monks didn't uh, use the box trees that you can see here uh, in order to, to draw their, uh, their squares um, th they used, um, you know, uh, 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 not annuals, um, perennial plants uh, like lavandas or uh, santalinas. And so the, the boxes w which, which came so in the 16th century are the, the second influence in this uh, French kitchen garden coming from Italy at the Renaissance, which will bring all the decoration, uh, so which are the the box trees, the little fountains, and also flowers. You, you, you see some flowers, that's in, the, in August. Uh, we, we, uh, that's 97, we had some uh, tobacco flowers uh, here. And so the, the French gardeners, the, the French architects in the 16th century will, um, will mix these two influences um, the medieval one from the abbeys and the Italian one from the Renaissance in order to create this decorative kitchen garden. In, in, the, in the gardens we have, um, we have very usual vegetables. We have two plantings per, uh, per year. The first one in the spring, which, is, uh, which begins in March, in the middle of March. Uh, in the spring, you have uh, so spring vegetables, uh, lettuces, uh, um, uh, beans, uh, lentils. And the second one that, that you see on this slide, uh, which is so in, in the summer, um, which begins at the end of June. So in one week at the end of June, we remove everything and put the all the vegetables that have been grown up in the greenhouses that we have on, on this place as well. So it means that every year you have to think uh, about which uh, veg vegetables you would put in which square because you, you have to make a rotation, of course, in order not to, to damage the soil. And also you have to take into account the the shape of the on the colors in order to make uh, like uh, a, a colorful checkboard with this uh, kitchen garden. So that's in the well, in September, probably end of September. This is the pumpkins. We when the leaves are damaged, we, remi we remove them and we put the pumpkins on little uh, plates in order that the water doesn't come too quickly in it. Uh, also, we have some decorative um, uh, cabbages that turn red or, or white, like this one in, in, in September. Um, very usual and, and very good, ac actually, vegetables. We don't use potatoes, which were not uh, used in Europe in the 16th century. But you, you can see the celeries. These are the beets, uh, the white beets. On the some views on, on the flowers. On each square you have, a, uh, on each of the, of the nice squares, you have uh, a surrounding of flowers and also the little apple in, cord in cordon, like you see here, in line. That's uh, October, probably. Um, it, you, so you have the, 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 the vegetables, some flowers, and also the fruits. Uh, and there are 16 uh, pear trees per, uh, per square. All is very geometrical, actually. And 
on, on the drawing of, of du cerceau, you can see some, some pear trees la, like this. It's difficult really to see which vegetables were used. Uh, so, so this kitchen garden is inspired by the, the drawing of du cerceau, but it can be considered as a creation of the, of the 20th century. And the idea was to, to create something in harmony with the chateau and to go back to the, to the spirit of, of this time more than a uh, uh, very accurate uh, uh, recreation. Details of the cabbages, you, you know, well, probably the middle of September, they are just turning red in the middle. With the first frost, you know, they, they change uh, colors. So we also have uh, uh, roses uh, on, uh, on foot. There are uh, 36 of them in each square. The details of the, of the cabbages. Um, so now, uh, well, we have described the, the kitchen garden. Let's go to the second garden on the second level, which is uh, an ornamental garden. Uh, on his function, so is to be uh, the outside living room of, of the chateau. Uh, in Villandry. Uh, the, the, the ornamental garden is made uh, out of box trees, you know, quite uh, high box trees like this, about 75 centimeters. Yews, uh, trimmed in, in topiaries, you see the yews, and flowers. So we, we also have two plantings uh, per year. Uh, that's April probably with the tulips. And then we have some myosotis which are underneath, which uh, are nice in May. And, uh, we have just replaced them uh, with the dahlias, which will bloom uh, uh, well, at, the end, uh, in the, at the end of June, or a little bit before the end of June. Uh, so this ornamental <laughs> garden, um, um, is, is quite um, good at this place. You know, it's similar to, 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 the, to the, in its geometry, to the one we saw in Bury, but it couldn't have existed in the 16th century in France. Uh, it, well, its function is, is well to be the outside living room, but the drawing is inspired. Uh, it was designed by uh, a Spanish artist called Lozano, a friend of my great-grandfather, uh, who took his inspiration into the, the Moorish gardens, like in uh, Alhambra, in Granada. And the geometry is very, um, is very close to the geometry used by the Arabs in uh, Andalusia. Uh, and there are symbols about love, and you could recognize some hearts uh, on the right, uh, which is uh, so the passionate love, uh, the, the tender love. You still have hearts on the right here, but this time broken by the passion. That's passionate love. You, you have the tragic love with the swords on, on the left. And you have uh, infidel loves with fans and uh, um, a fence in the corner and love letters in the middle and butterflies between the fans. <coughs> detail still in April with the tulips and you can see the myosotis. Oh, I think it's a forget-me-not in English, the current name. Still the same time of the year. So this, uh, the same garden in uh, August, probably with the dahlias. Uh, still, was well, that September? I guess that's the beginning of the end of the dahlias, end of September. So we try, uh, as we receive visitors from uh, really all year round, uh, we try to have some plantings efficient uh, almost all year round, from uh, the beginning of March to, to, to the middle of November. And uh, so the, the last garden that you can see as on the general view, which is a water garden, so it's, it's a very classical garden, so, so it could, it's more a, a French classical garden. And this uh, made with um, a water mirror in the shape of a Louis XV mirror. And this, uh, this mirror existed until the end of the 18th century. 
we have it on the on on the on the Napoleon plans uh, until even the beginning of the of the 19th century. It was destroyed uh, so in, in the, at the beginning in 18, 1830 around when the owner of the chateau wanted to create uh, a romantic uh, garden. And so my, my great grandparents just recreated it in the way it was uh, before. Uh, yes, I, I just want to add about this that on, on the plans of the beginning of the, uh, of the 19th century, just before the romantic garden, there were a potager at, at this, uh, exactly here, but uh, the plans are, are very unprecise. So there are six squares this time, but without any patterns in it. But there had been a potager here. Uh, well, uh, uh, still a view on this water garden, and so we have the, some swans and some ducks as well in this water garden. So I will now switch to the second part of my talk, which is about the management of the garden today. And uh, the specific interest of Villandry is that it's really a family management. So the, the, goal of the, the, goal, the goal of the family has always been to have a very good maintenance and to do the necessary restorations on the chateau and the gardens. Nowadays, the way to achieve this is to, to be open to the visitors on a very large scale and to please them uh, with a very well-kept gardens. So it's very important to have a, a nice and well-kept gardens uh, there are really many visitors, but we, we, you really have to remove the, the papers uh, once, uh, once a day. Um, so in order that they come back or send friends. Uh, nowadays, the, the chateaus cannot rely on the, you know, the, on the fortune of the family. It's much more uh, too expensive. Uh, uh, it costs around uh, one million pounds uh, every year to maintain Villandry in this state. So it cannot rely on, uh, on the family fortune, and the, the family has to find different ways to, to maintain uh, the chateau. So it's a, um, the best way is to, to have something professional on the touristic uh, organization. And uh, we, we are, has always uh, tried to, you know, to have the good quality. We spend very little money on advertising purpose. Uh, it's about, the, you know, the advertising, it's about 3% of the total incomes, which is uh, very few compared to what, the, for example, the Euro Disney or the, or the zoo will spend on, on this. Uh, but a lot on maintenance and restorations. And the big restoration works uh, nowadays we, we can spend about 40% uh, of a million pounds every year uh, on the big restoration works in Villandry. And so this, this method allowed Villandry to go from 50,000 visitors in the 1970s um, up to 350,000 uh, uh, in 98. And in 99, it should be maybe a, a little more. And in the same period, the number of gardeners has gone up from four in 1971, which was uh, really uh, not enough, of course, for the, for the five hectares of gardens, which are very dense. Uh, but the family couldn't afford to, to have more gardeners with only 50,000 visitors. To nine today, uh, and uh, I also have two apprentices, which are, uh, you know, it's a French system which is working quite well because they, they spend half their time in the school and half their time in the, in Villandry. So they learn a lot and they are uh, very useful as well. Um, I, I also have uh, created lately some activities, you know, because uh, the, the visitors want uh, more and more uh, not only the classical visit, but a place which would be lively. And uh, next week, for example, we will have uh, 10 days uh, for the children. And during these days, the children and the, the schools will be able to come. They will be received by the, the gardeners, 
and we have prepared a little uh, kitchen garden that they will be able to, to plant themselves. And also they, they will make uh, pl plenty of, uh, of, of little work uh, in gardening. And so th this method plays the visitors and uh, of course it's uh, important, important to interest the, the journalist as well. Uh, and uh, I can say that the, the marketing is, have, is, is done via the medias and the satisfaction of the visitors uh, rather than on pure uh, advertising in Villandry. To, to illustrate this, I will show some slides uh, of the last, of the, the, the latest re restoration works which were realized. Uh, so that's, um, I, I first show how it was before, the west side of the chateau and uh, the, 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 the wooden part under the roof was in a really in a very bad state. Uh, so we had to change completely the, uh, in French it's called the charpente, maybe the carpent if you, but I, I'm not sure, the wooden part uh, you, you can, probably you can understand. As a beam work, yes. We had to change all this beam work plus all the dormer windows because that's the west side, so all the wind is coming here and the rain. So all the decorative part on this, uh, on these uh, dormer windows were not here anymore. Uh, and all the, the slates on the roof. Uh, so that was done in 97, uh, and I'm going to show you the state, oh, I want, so that's during the, the work, you know. Uh, what we do, what we try to do is to keep some, to try, we try to, to keep most of the, the beam, but they all have to be removed and put back again. But many of them had to, to be changed uh, anyway. Some of them you see are new. Because in the 18th century, they wanted to create some uh, flats on the second floor, which should be the attics, not the flats. And so they cut the horizontal part of the beams. So the, the beam work was pushing on the walls, which is not uh, nice, of course. So, some details of the dormer windows. You see the, the candelars and the decorative part have been put back. Everything is covered by a, ve a very huge uh, roof that we call the parapluie in French, uh, an umbrella, which is a good name probably for this, but uh, it allows to, to work very quickly because you have to do these works uh, when the, uh, outside of the touristic season, of course. So that's the state nowadays. So that, that was in May uh, or June 97. Oh. That's uh, October, but uh, end of, of 97. And you see, all the, the facade has been uh, redone. So all the roof, of course, the, the beam work, and all the dormer windows. So that was quite an important work, uh, which was financed by the visitors. And now uh, I have begun uh, the other side of the chateau. That's the west side. You have this exactly the same uh, the same part on. The, on uh, the east side. Uh, it will be finished uh, at the end of 2000. Another work, uh, this time in the gardens. We had uh, four nice fountains, uh, remains actually of the, the only remains of the 18th century gardens. Y you see one of them, but they were really in a bad state and it was a bit dangerous for the visitors as well because uh, so we had to put some uh, iron work uh, underneath, uh, above, I mean. And uh, a photograph, it's not a very good photograph of the, the newly restored. That was uh, 96, the year before the, the roof. So you see that um, we can do a lot of restoration works, and uh, actually the chateau is more costly than the gardens. This is the gardens. We also have many uh, stones, uh, stone works around the potager, which had to be done, but the, the chateau is much more costly. But it's because of the gardens that the, the visitors come, and it's, it's because of the gardens, I should say grâce to the gardens, but I don't know in English. It's because of the gardens that uh, we can so restore the, the chateau. 
So, to finish my talk, I'm going to, um, to tell you, to explain you what in my views are the main features re required to get a quality garden. Um, so, the first thing, so to get a quality garden, is to have a good team. And uh, you, to have a, a good team, really, you need what is important in gardening uh, is motivation, because uh, it's a, it's a work where really you you, you can uh, if you are, if you don't have motivations, you can uh, you can. <coughs> You, you can uh, pretend you work without working. Uh, it's not, it's difficult to, it's not like the, in the army. You really, if you want some work to be done, you have to have some motivations. That was my point. And so, what, how to obtain the motivation of the, of the gardeners? Uh, what we do in Villandry is we, we have uh, one thing, one important thing of course, is we have uh, high salaries and uh, we have much higher uh, salaries than in all the, the gardens around. It's, it's about 50% uh, above, uh, f for, the, for, the, for the, the best gardener, it's 50% above uh, what we call the SMIC in French, which is uh, what you don't have in England, but uh, it's the level of, uh, under which you can't go. Uh, but it's 50% above this, and it's considered to be a very good salary. Uh, we also have very modern and efficient machines. Uh, we have uh, f three big uh, tractors, uh, tractopel, like in uh, Courance, a little uh, bobcat, you know. Uh, we ha have now, to, to trim the 1,200 one lime trees, we have a very nice platform with hydraulic secateurs, uh, which makes the work much, uh, much easier and much quicker as well, and, and more efficient. And it's also part of the motivation, you know, to have uh, uh, good tools for the, for the gardeners. And, um, of course, it's uh, w w one part of the motivation is the pleasure of working in a, in a nice place. And three families uh, of the gardeners, three families are, are uh, living uh, in the place. And the head gardener that you can see on the right here, uh, which is quite young, is about 35. Uh, lives uh, lives uh, in the kitchen while well, the house is just by the kitchen garden. So he is here really every day, and it's really uh, his garden. Um, so that's uh, in uh, in May probably with the giroflée and uh, and ponces. So th that's I think the most important uh, component, you know, to to have uh, a good garden. One important thing as well, is the design of the garden, of course. And um, about the design, what I could say is that, uh, well, of course, I'm not responsible for, for the design because it was my, my grandparents and they took their inspiration in the past. But I think it's, impor it's important in the case of the uh, chateau to have uh, gardens which, would be, which are in harmony with the, the chateau to create a complete uh, setting. So the people, the, the design, uh, another component is the water, and uh, it's something that really you have to, to be aware uh, of the important, uh, importance of the water. Uh, we, we, we used to, the water used to flow on a natural basis. It was um, going out the, the water table we had what we call a pure artesian, so the water was g the pressure was positive at ground level. Uh, now there had been so many uh, factories around on pumping for the the big uh, fields that uh, we have to pump it as well, 100 uh, meters uh, below the, the ground level. Uh, and maybe the, the water table one day will uh, disappear because it's it's uh, little by little it's going down. So. Uh, I have previewed to create a, a big lake above the gardens in order to, to get the water during the, the winter because we have, of course, many, many water going down the moats in the winter, so we could pump it and then use it in the summer. Uh, of course, we have automatic watering because uh, it would be much, much more time-consuming to, to do the water by hand. And with nine gardeners, of course, you can't do the, 
the, the, the watering by hand. So a good automatic, automatic watering is required. Um, yes, j just one thing about the, the, the team of Garnet. You see there, there are nine. Uh, all of them are, are coming from, uh, they, they don't have uh, usual intellectual backgrounds. Uh, the head Garner didn't make any studies. Uh, he didn't, he's not an engineer. So he began at uh, 17 and uh, 18 years ago. And, uh, but he's very intelligent, so he's always uh, trying to improve his, his knowledge. And all the, the gardeners are uh, coming from the farms. Uh, their parents were uh, farmers, you know. So they have always been uh, doing uh, practicing gardening, and, and they really are coming uh, from the very from the very close areas. But uh, with their motivation, they become very good gardeners. So I spoke about the water. Uh, of course, the soil is very important, and we have to follow. Every, uh, every year we make analysis of the soil to, to measure the, the pH and the different chemical components. And uh, when needed, we have to remove uh, some complete squares in the potager and put some new soil. So we have a very good field uh, not far from the gardens in which we can get some good soil. In. Because if your soil gets bad, uh, your vegetables or your flowers cannot uh, get good. And the, the last thing I will, um, I will tell uh, is planification or, and organization. And uh, I think really this is uh, necessary to have, a, you, you, you really have to rely on a good organization if you want to, to get a, a good gardens. Uh, for example, I will show you one project which is going uh, at the moment in Villandry with some slides, which is uh, the replacement of the vegetal structure. Uh, it's a very formal garden. So you have uh, one, more than 1,000 lime trees, uh, 300 taxus, uh, 72 kilometers of box trees. And really, these gardens rely mostly on the, on the structure. Of course, you have flowers and vegetables to go inside, but uh, the, the, what is really interesting is the structure. So, and with the structure, uh, with the vegetal structure, you can't really uh, work on a, on a daily ba basis. You have to plan in advance. And uh, nowadays, we have to, uh, well, to restore this vegetable, uh, vegetal structure. And uh, we have to change 200 lime trees, and 70, uh, yes, lime trees, 70 taxus like this. So uh, you, you have to plan this in advance. Uh, and we began this project in uh, 93 uh, with a very good uh, German nursery uh, called Bruns, so that's uh, very further north, you know, around Brema. And they prepared the, the lime tree with the, the shape used in Villandry, which is, of course, a specific shape, so you can't get it in a nursery. Uh, you, you have to, to wait uh, three or four years. Um, so that's one example to show you uh, that is very important in a garden to, to have a good planification. And uh, that's a detail of, of the structure. Th that was the, their first year, you know, of trimming. Uh, they have been input uh, uh, last year and this year. So now we have the 70 uh, taxes, but they are much better uh, nowadays. Uh, all the, you know, the, all the volume is covered uh, between the, the, the plates here. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, I will be glad to, to answer any questions about Villandry, if you have some. <laughs> or maybe we have to go to the, the tea. Uh, yes, it's, uh, well, to maintain the gardens, you need at least 250,000. Yeah. The extra visitors are for the big restoration work. But below 250,000 visitors, uh, the gardens will go down. Do you eat your vegetables? 
yes, well, it's, it's a very good bit of devotion, a very usual. And um, when we remove one planting, we have really a huge amount of vegetables. So we give them to the visitors. Of course, all the people working here uh, pick some, but it's not enough. So we really have to, to give a, a lot of them to the visitors. And uh, with the remaining part, which is not eatable, we make some compost for the next year. So nothing is lost with these vegetables. Do you give them or do you sell them? Uh, we give them because for fiscal reason we can't sell these vegetables. But uh, anyway, it's part of the pleasure of the visit. For you can uh, you can get some lettuce or some uh, peppers or some tomatoes depending on the time of the year. Do you open the, uh, any rooms of the chateau? Because when I was there. Ah, no, it's much, the opening is much wider, is uh, yes, 80% of the, of the inside of the chateau is open to the visitors, and 100% of the garden is open to the visitors, but uh, myself, I don't live in the chateau, I live in the, in the farm, which is, which is a nice farm, an existential building, in front of the chateau. So, the family doesn't live in the chateau? Uh, no, alors, there is a fiscal reason as well. Uh, which is that in France, uh, if, if the owner of the chateau wants to live in the chateau and if he wants to make big restoration works, he can't pay the, the, his restoration works with the money he gets from the tickets he, he sells. He has to pay it with his own income, so which is impossible uh, with, uh, as it's a uh, million of, uh, not pounds, but francs. So nobody gives the chateau? Uh, uh, well, it's a... Uh, it has to be quite lovely. We have, of course, flowers, uh, but uh, it's not compatible with the, the way it's run uh, today. And uh, I think it's more important to, to make sure that this chateau is well kept and has a restoration than living in the chateau. Do you know that London has its own Villandre and a very smart vegetable shop in this? Ah, yes, I, I, I heard about this, and I saw this on the internet as well. <laughs> When you put Villandre on the internet, well, you find the one in France, but you also find the restaurant. Um, is there an afterlimit? Uh, yes, there is. Well, it's, uh, I, I don't think you can take any number, of course, but uh, 350,000, it's not too much. Uh, even in the, the big days, because it's a very seasonal activity. So we have 85% uh, of the visitors from uh, May to September. In the big days, we have 4,000, and you, you, the, the people really doesn't feel that it's too crowded because it's five hectares, and you can go inside the chateau. So, you, well, if, if the people were going only in the chateau, of course, it would be too, too much. But, uh, yes. but uh, we could have 600,000. <coughs> Chateau as well on, on the other buildings, uh, and you 
have some some fields around on the it's, it's about 16 hectares of our but the work is in it must be in Italy. How long did it take your grand great grandparents to create uh, this car? So the chateau was restored from seven to eight and the gardens were created from eight to eighteen. Ten years. How many gardens did they have? So they had much more at this time, uh, they had fifteen. Uh, and they had a very good, very nice, uh, very well kept garden, but they had 15, and, uh, but of course they didn't rely on the visitor. Uh, my my great grandfather was uh, one of the first to open the gardens in the 20s to the visitors, but he had maybe uh, 3,000 per year, and uh, he was relying on uh, the wealth of uh, his American uh, <laughs> would you think? Would you think of changing some of the design? Uh, so the gardens and the chateau are registered, we call classé in French. Uh, so you can't make any work uh, changing the structure of the gardens or of the chateau without having the, the authorization of the Ministry of the Culture. Uh, so we have created lately uh, two new gardens around the greenhouses, uh, but you can't change what exists. You are allowed uh, Yes, of course you could, but uh, I don't see the point of changing the main gardens, which really is a place where you feel very well. It's a place done for, you know, for uh, living. How do you control the public uh, <coughs> when children play in the box? Or how do you control yeah, the public? Yes, that's important, of course. Uh, we don't have, in the chateau, we have people watching uh, surveillance, French, but in the gardens, so it's a, well, as a gardener working, uh, but during weekends and after uh, after four o'clock in, in the summer, uh, th there are nobody uh, watching the, the visitor. But the idea is to have things very well kept, and th the respect is very high. Uh, we, we we had never any uh, vandalism. I don't know if it's the same name in English, but maybe. Uh, and second thing, th this garden is uh, fortunately it's it's really uh, a garden designed to receive many visitors. Uh, for example, in the kitchen gardens, you have very large alleys, and each of the squares is surrounded by little fences. So the people who have little uh, ropes uh, in the entrance of each of the squares, but the people never enter. And of course, if, if, if they, they would enter in the, in the square, they could damage the, the box really, but uh, they stay in the big alleys, and you see very well the, the garden from this alley. So it's, it's fine at the moment. Then I don't know. Very, uh, which are very uh, narrow, so we 
can't get uh, wheat fillers on this because of the boxes which are very fragile. You know, ideology about using things or not using things, but things important to to use the modern techniques. Once every Friday, we do the complete wrapping, uh, but it lasts quite long yet, the wrapping, uh, because you don't shrink on the large alley where the people walk. Uh, you you wrap the little alley of the alley, uh, as nobody walks on it. You, you said you didn't grow potatoes. The idea about uh, the choice of vegetables and flowers uh, is to use uh, uh, vegetables that were used during the, the Renaissance, but we really use modern species, you know, of these. Mm -hmm. Because the, the old species are usually uh, a bit weaker, you know, and we want nice colors and nice shape, and we want them to, to be uh, resistant to the disease. So as long as their ancestors Yes, that's the idea. <laughs> what about the flowers? What? what about the flowers? Yes. Do you insist on having flowers that were, that were used in the 16th century? Uh, no, it's more for the, for the vegetables. But also flowers, we, uh, we try to have uh, nice flowers as well. The very, very important thing, you know, is that uh, really the, the, the structure of the garden is the main thing. And, uh, you also want to have some colors from March to, to October. So you have to, uh, to fill this uh, structure <coughs> with flowers which will last uh, quite long. Uh, so we have the dahlia, the begonia, the petunia, the very usual but very uh, hard uh, flowers which resist well to the, to the rain and to the diseases. And tulips. Yes, we, we have established uh, a twin edge in 1995 with uh, Hatfield House. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, and we have met, met some exchange. Uh, uh, the head gardener of uh, the went to Hatfield and uh, has been practicing the, the techniques. And uh, also the head gardener of Hatfield came in the uh, Villanthe. And he actually tasted a little English mixed border in one of the new garden around the greenhouses to see a different kind of uh, garden. Because in France, we tend to have box trees, and in the box in the square, you have only one kind of vegetables or flowers. And you see, as in England, you have also box trees, but you put many of them in one uh, square. So we have this uh, mixed border. <coughs> but I'm, I'm not uh, a specialized in uh, gardening. Uh, I, I, I've been graduating in engineering, but I do a complete tour, of course, every day of the gardens, and I can see what is going wrong. So uh, now I know what to do when something is going wrong, and I know which people to to get advice on. Thank you very, very much indeed.
The lecture will be improvised, my main qualification being Barbara's husband. So you have now seen two of the most magnificent gardens in France and we can only congratulate the organizers because they have chosen the other extreme so that you have all the scope. I have now about the same numbers of visitors as Mr. Cavallo when he started, which is 3,500 a year. Um, it is a small garden, which is on about two acres of walled garden, surrounded by around 16 acres of land. And you have a first glimpse of both sides. These, on the left, you have the view taken from the house as you go out into the garden. On the other side, you have the view from the top window of the roof towards the entrance. So you have a glimpse of the proportion and what it looks like. It is in Normandy between Caen and Bayeux, but we will see that better. This is the garden itself. Um, in its present state on the left and about six years ago on the right you can see for example on the top terrace that there were no alleys you have no trace of alleys and there were no fountains and there were quite a few modifications in between but it gives you a, a glimpse of the, of, the, of the feeling this is again it's a very geometrical garden with a complete symmetry. Uh, this on the left is viewed from a little turret which we added on top of the roof recently because we found in the beamwork the traces of an octagonal foundation and we recreated the, the structure according to the foundation. You see that little turret on the right. It now sits in the middle of the roof. When we, when we came in, there was, there was just a flat roof. This is the door, as it is now, on both sides. Voila, this is where I wanted to come to. Um, you have Bayeux on the left, Caen on the bottom right, and we are just uh, south of Aramanche. The landing uh, happened uh, without uh, destruction. Brécy was occupied by a British artillery regiment on the evening of the landing of D-Day. And the Germans had withdrawn on the Red Road, which is immediately southeast of Brécy, and there was happily no fighting, and most of the uh, architectural structure remained. On the right, you have uh, an aerial photograph which was taken about two years ago. It shows a house, the house in the middle, which is fairly small, uh, which was built before the gardens in 1620. It was built as a uh, fairly modest house with a central staircase and no windows even in the roof. The, the, the dormer's window were added a few years later together with the garden. And this house was sold in 1650 to a parliament, uh, the chairman of the parliament of Caen, who decided to embellish it and built the, the enormous entrance door which you see at the bottom of the photograph on the right, the gardens and the window, uh, the dormers and the roof, and a few other embellishments around, then the pavilions and the garden, etc. The place had been inhabited before by monks, and it still has the feeling of, of a place which was inhabited by monks. They stayed there for about three centuries, and they left in uh, about 1600, 
selling off uh, to, to the, the chap who built the, the first house. The church which you see on the right, which is, which is covered with tiles, is their church, which was started in around 1400 and uh, modified a bit later in 1520. The surroundings, uh, the surroundings you, you can see on the right, agricultural land, um, it is a hill on the right, the garden slopes up, you see the, the garden on the photograph goes down, but in fact it goes uphill, and the hill is at the bottom right there of the photograph, and that hill is solid choke with very, very little topsoil. Brécy is just at the bottom of the hill where the land starts to be flat and the name comes from uh, the same uh, origin as Brèche, uh, which means a, a breach of slope. You have many other villages in Normandy which are called like that and they always are where the slope is, is changing. After that you have a flat plain which is fairly slightly acid. So we have the best of both worlds that we can plant on chalk on the hill and on fairly acid soil underneath. Uh, you have on the left the drawing of the garden, which you have also on, on the little plans. I didn't bring enough, I'm sorry. And you have uh, from the left, you see the courtyard with the, uh, the house uh, in pink. Then you have a first level, uh, which is absolutely on the ground floor of the house, which is flat where you have the, the box parterres, and after that you have four terraces slope going uphill, and they are all tilted towards the house, so that they can best be seen uh, from the first floor of the house. Uh, I have, at this stage, two uh, little corrections to make on the, on the uh, announcement, because uh, obviously, I'm, as, as already said, I'm not Barbara Wirt. And the second one is the, 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 the phrase uh, says, the gardens of Brissy and their resurrection. It is actually just a restoration because we must pay homage to the two former families who restored Brissy before us. There was a French actress of the Comédie Française who bought it and saved it in 1914 and it was then listed as a historical monument, completely listed, because she knew all the ministers and she wanted a complete listing, <laughs> and therefore uh, everything is listed, including the loo and, uh, my God, it's, uh, all the inside is listed and it's really not worth it. Um, and it's a pain because it means control of the inside. Um, but that's it, and the second uh, campaign started in 1955, where the place uh, which had gone down again because she died in 32 and it became a farm and you had uh, again some, some agricultural activity even in the garden. And in 55 it was bought by a French writer called Jacques de la Crotelle who had married uh, um, a girl from a neighboring property and was taken there by Maurice Druon who is another famous French writer, now German secretaire de l'Académie la, Française and Maurice Druon took Jacques de la Crotelle in 55 and he fell in love with the place and even though he was like me from Burgundy and he, he, he told his children that he always wanted to live in Burgundy and he fell in love there and I had exactly the same course. Um, and this, this man uh, loved Brissy and really started the gardens. And a lot of the basis of the garden design that you see here comes from him he made obviously uh, uh, what you can later judge as a few mistakes because especially what we, what we regret is he created this lovely box back there just behind the house where actually we would love to have a flat and empty area in order to circulate. Uh, as soon as we are more than 20, uh, we don't know where, where to put ourselves. Now, this, these are photographs uh, which go on showing um, about 1900 or 1920 on the left and recent photographs on the right. This is the top of the garden and it is built uh, with these four pillars. And obviously, the, uh, Jacques Lebas, when he conceived this garden, we don't know who was the architect, 
neither for the house nor for the gardens. But Jacques Le Bar had certainly been to Italy, or he had a, a designer who had been to Italy, because there is a lot of Italian influence in the terraces. And also, uh, his son became a priest, and he was probably himself well-versed in, in, in religion, because there is a, a great symbolism of the gate of paradise opening to the sky. And um, everybody who wrote about Brissy felt that you were inside an earthly paradise when you were in the garden, looking towards the final paradise, which is the sky through the gate. Now this is what I did behind, because behind that gate, you see the shadow of the gate, including probably two people unknown. Um, behind, well, I'm not very skilled there. Well, uh, behind the, the, the gate, there was a field, a plowed field. And the field uh, led to a fence, which you don't see anymore, because what we did was, A, to plant, uh, remove the, the cultivation, and plant hornbeam, which you see on both sides. And behind the hornbeam, we planted every five meter beech trees, which you will see in a few years coming over the hornbeam. The, the idea being to really have a, a, a straight line to, to the sky. And at the end of the hill, uh, there was happily a construction a few miles towards Caen of a supermarket and I could get all the topsoil from it and I raised the level of the land by about nine feet so that you could, uh, you could avoid seeing the, the, the hedge and the barrier and, and the cars on the road. You have the same view on the right uh, but from the, from the top of the hill. And the landscape around is still impeccable because it is very rich land uh, and everything is cultivated to the last uh, meter and therefore no ugly houses in the view, nothing. This is the plantation sort of five years ago. And you can see the hedge. It's before the, the lifting was entirely, f it, the lifting had started probably, a few trucks already. Now this is the gate as it was before Rachel Boyer, so it's sort of 1900. And Rachel Boyer did a first restoration campaign. Um, then uh, there was no restoration campaign of the walls of the garden uh, under the Lacretelle. They, they actually planted the box, but they did not do a lot of work on the, on the structure of the garden. Um, I will stop there a minute to, to explain that the listing of the garden, uh, I said everything was listed, um, Rachel Boyer had everything listed that she cared for, and she was not very much a gardener. So the listing of the garden is uh, literally the listing of the architectural elements of the garden, which means uh, all the vases, the balustrades, everything, the steps, and, but not the land itself, and under French law, if the land is not listed, you are still allowed to do what you want in terms of plantation. So we can actually organize the garden the way we want, and we don't have to get permission from the architect en chef des monuments historiques to organize our, our plantations in the garden. Uh, even though outside of the garden, we fall under the law of the uh, 500 meters surrounding a historical monument. And therefore, when I built that hill at the end of the view, or when I planted the avenue on the other side, I got uh, problems with the architect des bâtiments de France because uh, I had done that without his formal permission. It was finally agreed that it could stay, but for a moment uh, there was a bit of uh, gendarme walking in and saying I was in contravention of such and such an article. So this is again the house before Rachel Boyer. That's the way she, she saw it in 1910, 1914. Uh, on both sides covered with thatch. The wonderful lions which sit on both sides of the gate fallen on the ground 
And the, the gate, by the way, is 11 meters high to the, to the top of the, of the stone. This is the inside of the garden again in 1920, and this is the same garden recently with a, um, I will not tell you what they are, but they are all the kitchen herbs, uh, which my wife planted in the middle of uh, squares of box. And there is an old well along the wall and the, the church which you see behind from the monks. This was uh, probably the little building for the kitchen at some stage, and it had a bread oven at the bottom of it. Uh, the roof fell sometime in 1930s, and they, or they just removed it. Uh, we don't exactly know how it happened, but when La Crotelle found the place, it was already without a roof, and we've left it without a roof in order to, to have a, a sheltered wall garden. The two little uh, doors on both sides are, are quite beautiful. They, they are probably some of the best proportions of the sculpture. These are the central lines, a bit the same as the two lines which you saw on both sides of the, of the, of the main gate, but they are now sitting in the middle of the garden. And the garden has proportions which are very carefully calculated. The, the man who drew it not only knew very well the hill, because he fitted very well inside the hill, uh, but he also knew his proportions quite well. You find the golden number quite a lot of time. And for example, the central ellipse at the middle of the steps is exactly level with the first floor of the house, within, within uh, half an inch. And the, the pylons who support the lines are not in line with the walls. They are slightly turned so that the lines face you a little more than they should if, if the, the pylons had been constructed with their axis parallel to the wall. You see uh, yews which come probably from a much earlier time and were, were left to grow. And the history of the house is that president of parliament really, building it up, uh, building the gardens and doing a very beautiful small residence in Normandy for himself in the period 1650 to 1680. He then died, his son succeeded and he was a priest and then it went to a nephew and then it went on in the same family until uh, just after the revolution where it was uh, abandoned by the family and sold. And it was sold to a farmer who turned the whole place into orchard. Every terrace had apple, uh, apple trees, cider apples, and the ground floor, uh, which is level with the house, had, had actually cows which were walked in from the side. The same, this is an apple, cider apple, behind the line. The same terraces, this is the top terrace. Um, now, obviously you see the state of the walls. Uh, they were a little repaired by Rachel Boyer, not too much. Lacretel kept them more or less as they are so that when we arrived, we had a campaign of four years, and this is why you still see a lot of barren wall, because we could not plant too much against the walls until we had repaired. And we repaired every single wall, 13 stair steps, flight of steps, which had to be all uh, removed uh, and reassembled. And half of the vases, half of the balustrades, it went over four years. Uh, happily, at that time, uh, there was, a, as you heard, a Mission Jardin in the ministry, and they had credits dedicated to gardens, which were not used, amazingly, and they had the surplus. So uh, we could really, as long as I did my, my part, which was spending the half, the state followed me and spent the other half. So we could do all that uh, under the supervision of the architect en chef des monuments historiques. And we could do all that over, over four years fairly rapidly. Uh, in comparison, when we repair the house, it's not the same. You see the roof of the house on the right. I applied for government assistance, which was due in the same proportion, 50-50. 
and they could never give it because it entered on a different line of credit which was the regional line of credit for Normandy and there are so many monuments in Normandy and so many churches where the roofs are leaking that they always said next year, next year, next year. And also I heard that in the offices of the DRAC they said, well, when it will rain on his head, he will do it himself. <laughs> Which I finally did. <laughs> you see the vase on the top right there? It's brand new. It was totally gone. And I convinced the architect en chef that it should be reinstated and he finally agreed. We found the sculpture and over a few, few years we, we agreed on the size and the shape and we had, it, had them in. That's the pavilion restored. When you visit the garden you must remember that everything inside the walls is Barbara, everything outside the wall is more or less me. Um, but we, we do share opinions. But the, she has an absolute veto on everything inside the garden. And she followed a very clear rule, which was to follow the architecture, which was there, the stone architecture, and limit my uh, inclination to, uh, as, as any newcomer, to plant a little too much or too, too varied. So she has limited the plantations inside the garden to box and yew a lot of hornbeam and um, for the rest roses and clematis. Now this is probably the most interesting piece of sculpture. Uh, there should be a person standing next to it because it is about four meters high, uh, the, the, the big um, volute. I don't know if you say volute in English. Volt? So, and it is about uh, half a meter thick, the stone. Now, we are seeing the first wall of the parterre, which is really uh, we've decided not to call it a terrace because it's really the parterre and it's the, the only part which is flat. You probably see on the photograph, uh, the old photograph, the top of the wall is horizontal and then the wall of the first terrace is tilted upwards. You have a breach of slope. And um, when we came, there were, there, there were plants all over the place and this was uh, an area where we removed the plants entirely to install these, these boxes, uh, which are the same as the Versailles boxes, done with pig iron uh, structure and oak panels. And the blue is, uh, was chosen by, by Barbara. Now, this is the church before Rachel Boyer, and, and Rachel Boyer spent most of her effort on the church, on the house first, and the church. And you can see the state of the church. And in the 1925 postcards, the church is repaired. Now, a view, uh, the hornbeam um, I planted, I took the idea from David Higgs Garden in England, and I planted a first row of hornbeam with the trunks which are showing against the, the as, a, as a bossage, on the wall of hornbeam which is underneath it. And you must uh, understand that it was planted only five years ago, so it's not exactly what it should be. And it should be a solid mass overhanging uh, another mass which, which is underlined by the trunks of the mass above it. And the overhang of the mass above should be about one meter so that you can walk along the two sides under shade. Now, on the right you have a view of probably the, the most touching part of the whole place, which is the churchyard, where probably most of the monks who were there have been buried. And it was plain grass when we came in, and my wife planted a collection of wild roses and three Irish ewes. 
and we are slowly redoing all the roofs uh, because the church is in tiles and we are redoing all the roofs on both sides in tiles also because I think you see the farm afterwards and the farm is also in tile, the, the neighboring farm. These buttresses in, in, in you were planted also five years ago only. Normandy is quite, quite good. Now this view is the, 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 the Lacretel La garden in its very beginning. It's, it's a 1960 photograph which was given to me by Anne de Lacretel, the, the, the daughter of, of the two, of the couple who, who organized this. And uh, by the way, they are both buried in the church that you see there. Uh, Jacques de Lacretel died in 85 and his wife died in 91. And they are both buried in, in, in the church. You see the house in its state again of 1960 without the little uh, clocheton in the middle and with its old roof which is uh, 1900 done in 1920 by Rachel Boyer, 1900 style. And this is the, the initial plantation of La Cretel. And thereafter he put the basins in, in the middle and, and forgot about the alleys, let, let the alleys go. And what you see framing the skyline and what I'm trying to reorganize is a solid line of elm on both sides. And obviously the elm disappeared completely. And when we arrived, there was absolutely nothing. When we arrived, the top of the hill was completely barren. You see the, the, the land as it was before, where you can see the hedge and the road behind the elms and, and the, the Lacretel plantation. And then you see the Lacretel plantation a few years later. Again, a few years later, we're still, we're still under Lacretel time. And on the parterre, they took um, a drawing from the book of Claude Mollet, Les Jardins de Plaisir, and they did exactly the drawing of the book. Planting box. Oh, I want to show you what we removed. This was this, this uh, bed of the flower bed, which was hiding the, the, the pylons. That was still there when we arrived in 92. And this is what we, what we removed. And we would not have been able to remove that if the land had been listed, if the garden had been listed. But happily, the listing was only the architectural elements. That has been really a, a very important element. Now this is to show you what happened during the repair of the staircase and I have here in the room one of the men who was working digging the trenches. This is the trench work to supply because obviously we had no water. Uh, that was a big problem because Normandy used to be wet, it is now becoming very dry in summer. So I, I dug a well, I had to do it only in one spot which was the only way where I could bring machines. And so I told them to drill there and to go as deep as they could to get water. And we found water at 104 meters deep. So we now, we now have water and therefore we installed automatic watering all over the place. The state helped me for the reconstruction of the walls and architectural elements. For all the garden work, trenches and watering and, and well and all that, obviously I had to do it alone. This is the building of the little clocheton after the roof has been redone and this is the, the final state of the, of the clocheton. And basically we followed, uh, we, we were all in agreement on, on, on that. Um, we have taken the thick old uh, slate to cover all the pleasure buildings, the two pavilions and the house, because they are connected with the garden. And we, we went back to tiles because uh, we wanted everything around to be with the same roof material. So the farm, the church, the farm you see on the left of the church, the farm, the church, and the two uh, aisles of the courtyard are now covered with tiles. What you see is the winter dress of the uh, laurel because uh, in boxes they suffer from the, from the cold. 
This is the clipping of the box and I fully agree with my most impressive colleague that uh, the workers are really the key element in any garden. And we have three wonderful uh, Normans from the area, two of them skilled gardeners who work inside the garden, mostly under my wife's supervision, and one man, uh, a, a bit less skilled but a very good working man who does all the outside and the supervision and the planting outside of the hedges and of all the woodland which I've tried to, to reorganize outside the, the walls. You see, this is an intermediate stage. It's already tiled on the right and still sl all slate on the left. Details of the sculpture, obviously. Um, the most important thing of Brissy actually is the, the sculptural quality of the stonework. And my friends tell me there is absolutely no merit in having a beautiful garden when one has such a beautiful stone frame. And they are true. The only thing is to follow the frame and keep to it. This is, the, the lines are two-headed. They, they face in both directions. There is one face to the right and one to the left. Well, there I can show you something interesting. You see on you, trials of, of uh, coating on the panel. Now, the first architect en chef des monuments historiques, looking at that garden, uh, said that the first thing he wanted to do was to cover all the walls with a new coating, flat and smooth. And I said, every single wall? And he said, every single wall? I said, including the church in the background? He said, including the church in the background. Then I said, no, we disagree. He said, I'm the architect. I said, I'm the owner. And, and we had complete stalemate. And the only way out was a law which was voted by under Monsieur Malraux when he was Minister of Culture, which said that if there was stalemate, the, the owner could apply to the ministry and uh, uh, ask for permission to go to another architect en chef. This was used very infrequently in France because you can imagine that the administration will kill you if you do it. Uh, but I had no choice, so I did it and I got another architect en chef who's absolutely charming and nice called Monsieur Lagneau and we get along perfectly well together and everything has been happy ever since. But of course uh, there was a bit of turmoil. Winter and summer. The, the composition of the photographs and the way they have been assembled took a number of days to, to my wife and she was a bit disappointed that I would be stealing her show, which I'm, which I'm doing with admiration. Now, um, the, the basin uh, which you see is La Crotelle, the alleys uh, we have created and we have not finished our work because we want obviously to connect the alleys so we have to remove the grass around and have about half a meter or a little more two feet wide of sand to surround the, uh, the stone of the basin. In the middle there was absolutely nothing and it was very empty. So what you see is a, is a drawing from Barbara which she had uh, accepted by the architect en chef des monuments historiques, which was quite something, because it was really uh, the introduction of a new stone element in a listed garden. And the architect en chef decided that A, it was all right, and B, it could eventually be removed. Uh, it weighs 2.6 tons, and it has to be carried by hand. But it can be removed, because it was brought in. It's a heap of artichoke on a basket, and uh, artichokes exist all over the garden in, in sculpture, in the vases, uh, in the various decoration, all over the place there is, you, you see artichoke. This is to show you the beach on the left, which are still small, but which, which will be left to grow to their maximum size. Um, and the, the overhanging eventually, the the base of clipped horn beam, which will be stopped at around five meters high. 
On the right, you have the plantation in Beach, of a triple avenue of Beach, for the uh, arrival from, from, the, from the main uh, plain outside. From, from the bottom, you see the, the gate and, the, and the, the middle of the house, and you see the triple avenue of Beach, which, which is there. And then outside all these plantations, which you do not really see well, maybe before on the aerial photographs, you have every connecting field planted with, with uh, cider apples. Again, still young, but eventually there will be 700 cider apple trees uh, blocking the wind and, and framing the view. This is the other fountain. Uh, the, uh, on the side fountains, you have a potager on one side and, and a, a sort of orchard on the other side. There, there you see uh, raspberries. This is the Clematis spooneri on, uh, on the former bread oven. And this is a view of, of the side of the house to the other door. Now, as you have probably seen, the garden is still very flat, and we don't know at all what was planted. We had two different groups, uh, one very professional of three ladies called Boulingrin in France, who are specialized in doing uh, literature search on the, the, the origins and the history, especially of gardens. There is one architect, one botanist, and one archive specialist. And these three uh, ladies have searched for about two years everywhere. And then we also had search in the American universities and in England, and we could not find any description of the gardens as they were when they were built. So what we know from the stone, we know from looking at it, because it's still there. But the way it was planted when this, this beautiful stone architecture was done, I, I feel that it was much more intricate and complicated, and that there were uh, palisades of hornbeam and, and much, much more sophisticated arbors and, and, and to, to balance the, the, the stone. As I told you, we couldn't plant along the walls we are now planting because the, the wall restoration is finishing, but we are just planting the clematis and the roses and things like that. But uh, we are also planting uh, an arbor on the first terrace. This big staircase went down on the initial drawing of La Crotelle on, a, on an alley which was going sideways, and there was no, and there was no line of connection. So we, what we planted was um, uh, hornbeam in order to eventually achieve a cloister effect, walking under the shade of the hornbeam and having the views on the side as, as walking under a cloister gallery and some benches. These are two big roses, Francis Lesser, which fill the, the void of the curve on both sides of the, uh, of the top gate to the sky. This is a more detailed view of the potager, again with lots of artichokes, but these we can, these we can eat, uh, and some others are even bigger and are not to be eaten but just looked at. The, the, these on the right, yes. Uh, uh, pear trees. All that is still young because the wall was repaired last year. This is a more detailed view of the herb garden. So you have four herbs in the four places between the five uh, squares of boxes. And you've got laurel in the middle, and you've got again four more herbs in the, in the little pots in the middle of the box. This is the other little courtyard on the side. These are the box, and obviously, one would like to take all that box drawing, put it on the terrace above it, and and organize something to walk around with with boxes and fountains, and be able to have a gathering uh, on on the parterre. 
The garden, if you come and see it, is best uh, when the sun sets because you get the effect you see on the, on the left. This is around six in the afternoon or a few hours before sunset. And the same, same hour on the right you see, and on the left also you see the shade. And, and the sun makes the stone practically pink. Now this is artwork more than... One of the most interesting features of the garden is the sky. Living there, uh, the sky is always changing and it is absolutely incredible because what you see there, I see at least twice a month. Voila, a nice small place for retirement. <laughs> Wait, I had forgotten the questions. Three, two inside, one outside, full time, and sometimes a contractor to do the difficult clipping of the trees is high up. A lot of work had to be done to maintain the few remaining old trees, which were essentially ash on the hill and a few beech because of chalk, and uh, in the plain underneath, lime and uh, horse chestnut and, and, and um, castanea. The water is all pumped out of the well, and without the water, a lot of the plantations would have died. Because we now have sometimes four months with nearly no rain in summer. That's a hell of a distance to go down a hundred and something meters. Yeah, it took them two days. They were drilling with a machine, and it was. That, that is the water level around you. I had no idea it was, but this is where they found water. And it was, it was very good water. Um, the, I forgot to say that the main problem is the wind, by far. Uh, for example, when, when I plant on the hill, uh, the, the, the beach are all very happy up to about three quarters of the hill. When you get to the top quarter, they die. They are, they are just killed by the, by the dry drying effect of the wind, continuous wind, and we are five miles uh, in a straight line south of, this, uh, of the channel, four and a half miles, and it's the first hill. So did you plant windbreakers to we, we, protect the yeah, beach? Yeah, we planted with windbreakers to protect the apple trees who will protect the, the beach, who will protect the hornbeam, but all that is growing at the same time, so nobody is protected. <laughs> The windbreakers and the hedges we planted, uh, the first line of windbreakers was acacia and uh, pterocaria, uh, because they grow so fast, with a lot of ash, uh, and that's in the hedges for, for bigger trees. Further down in the plain, poplars, because in the plain there was enough uh, humidity that the poplars would, would, would go. So uh, these are the first windbreaks. And underneath, uh, all the little uh, things which you plant in, in hedges normally. But no conifers? No conifers at all, except because I like some conifers. I have a hidden corner which nobody sees where I have a few conifers. Which conifers? <laughs> I have, I have pseudolaric fastigated. Uh, as a lion, and I have uh, Pinus nigra fastigate, and I've planted Pinea to see if I would manage to have parasol pines. They are, they are about that high. But it's really the wind, the, the most worst, worst concern. Both. Very Both. Annoying, it is very impractical. You, um, when the children of the family see the visitors, they call them the pilgrims, because they walk in line always. 
because the, the alleys are so narrow that they, they follow each other up, up, to the, up to the shrine of the hill. So we have, how many pilgrims do we have today? So. <laughs> The stone, stone is, is, is aged, it depends on the, on the firm. One firm is using chemical and it's usually very good in the beginning and it becomes too dark with time and it ends up not very good looking. And the other firm is mixing a wonderful combination of milk, uh, rotten milk and cow dung and all sort of things. And that works beautifully and it grows moss and it, it gets ra rapidly natural. Is that basket of artichoke, is it a fountain or just a decoration? No, no, it is a fountain but an artificial fountain. It is a hollow, otherwise it would be even, even heavier. There is, there is a big hollow underneath it and there is a pump which just pumps the water from the basin and pumps it up and then it flows on the artichoke and falls down again. Just a circulation pump. But because the basins are now connected to the well, I have a continuous little flow of well water through the basin to keep it clean and, and not smelly. Um, was there any trace sign of an orangerie? No, what, what was on the left was not an orangerie. It, it was really uh, the bread oven and the kitchen and um, you know, maybe lodging of servants, but it was never an orangerie. I don't think they ever went for, for orangerie. And that is one of the big problems we have because w in, in, the, in the boxes we, we have ilex or we have crategus or we have plants which, which resist to the cold because we cannot uh, take the, the, the boxes into, into a warm house. We have a little greenhouse on the side but we, where we can only handle things by hand. Uh, to come into the garden, you have, you, you have to come from the top and then walk down the steps or you have to come through the house or you have to come through the, one of the little doors sideways, the one towards the church which is connected to the road. There is a, a, a wider alley along the church which connects you to the road. So when you have really heavy things coming in like, like the fountains, the, we bring a crane on the, on, on the field the crane spans about 40 meters and drops the load just on the edge inside the, 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 the terrace and then we ferry on the terrace by hand. Eight men and cylinders and all that, a bit of soap. This is spotted on some of the photographs, something to keep the grass from the alley. From yes, the what is yes, uh, I saw in Courance the, 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 the cement. I wanted to, to have something which would be as, uh, uh, not too visible and I, did, I saw it in the Tuileries and uh, Benesh is, is somewhere there and uh, I've just copied. He, he, it's it's uh, steel uh, from the factory, just raw steel, uh, one foot wide and uh, 10 millimeters thick, one, one centimeter. And it is held every meter, it's six meters long, which is the standard length, and it is held.